Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, third panel of the Affirmative Feminism Seminar Series. So the third panel will be on curation and distribution. So you may have heard this before, but I'm going to repeat it for those who haven't. So I am Maud Kutrich. I am a researcher in film studies and digital culture at the University of Bergen. I um, have researched, uh, or I, I um, so in my research, I, I do, um, I look at affirmative aesthetics and willful women in contemporary cinema and on which I have published a book, as you may know. And this idea comes from uh, Rosie Bredotti's idea of affirmative ethics and politics, in which uh, she says that we need to look at the present uh, with a critical view, but not sink in uh, negativity and instead propose alternatives and uh, possible futures. So, but what I found in, in my research was both in, in film theory and in the films themselves actually, is a lot of binaries that define uh, gender, sexuality, class, race, and space as well. So for example, private and public space. And in those binaries, I also saw a lot of um, negativity. When we look at uh, the present, we uh, lament the status quo and we lament what it is, but there are, there are very uh, few films that actually uh, propose something different, propose an alternative. So um, in, uh, in this current research that I'm undertaking now, I realized as well that um, in, in and the Me Too movement, I'd say, uh, has something to play in this, I guess. Um, but I realized that we need to look at the full life cycle of a film and not only concentrate on what is on screen, but also look at production and uh, distribution um, to, to actually know how come we have certain models and certain negative models um, on screen and why we don't have more affirmative models or feminist models. So for this, I invited a brilliant panelist to join us and talk about curation and distribution today. So I'm going to invite them now to turn on the camera. So this is, um, so the first speaker uh, today will be Skadi Loist. Uh, she's a professor of, uh, professor of production um, culture in uh, media industries and in audiovisual media industries. Then will be Nadia Dresti, who is uh, international advisor at the Locarno Film Festival. Hello. Um, Mathilde Enro, who is um, a committee uh, a programmer uh, at the Locarno Film Festival. And she's also the co-founder of the platforms um, film, uh, festival Scope and uh, Festival Scope Pro. And uh, Miriam De Rosa, who is a bit late, uh, but she uh, will uh, come very soon. And uh, Emily uh, Wright, um, who is an artist and she is the, she is the, oh, Miriam De Rosa is there, but she's, where is she? <laughs> in the participants, so I have to find her. Um, and uh, Emily Wright, who will uh, give you some house rules today. She is an artist and, um, and the research assistant for this um, seminar. Hi everyone, welcome. Hello, nice I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Just to say I'm here too, but I can't seem to find my camera setting. So probably you need to make me co-host, but hi everybody. Hi, Miriam. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't seem to be able to make you co-host for some reason. Um, or maybe because I'm not the host. Uh, I am the host. I don't, I don't want to slow down anybody. So if you want to start with it, I'm sure we will find a way before my time yeah. is there. <laughs> maybe it's in your settings. Maybe you have to leave and come back. I don't know. Um, but yeah, okay, Emily cool. will... I'll do that. Yeah. Emily will introduce you a bit of house rules now. Yes, hi, uh, welcome. Uh, I'll be in the chat room today moderating the chat and fielding any questions that you might have uh, to the panelists. 
We also have a Q&A button that you're welcome to use to ask questions in a live format, um, or you can raise your hand and have the opportunity to speak um, with the panelists directly. Uh, we'll be filming or recording today's session uh, and all of the seminars will be available um, online at a later date, but we're filming for further research and distribution. Um, yeah, looking forward to today's seminar. Thanks for joining. So we'll first hear, uh, thank you for this, I uh, will first hear from uh, Skadi Loist about um, how she uh, sees uh, distribution and um, distribution and curation as affirmative and uh, how it affects her work as well. Yes, thanks Maud for organizing the whole series basically. Um, I've also listened into the other two and I think it's, it's an excellent arc to go via the production and, um, and aesthetic side and now come also to curation and distribution. And maybe I'm gonna start off with the bit of what I'm doing um, as a professor for, for, for see it's, it's the, the name is so complicated I can't even say it myself. It's the Professorship for Production Cultures in Audiovisual Media Industries. So basically I'm coming from media studies, uh, yeah, film studies, media studies side angle and look into the film industry. But I've also have a background in working with and for film festivals and also researching film festivals for a long time. So I have, I'm speaking mostly from an academic perspective, but have a lot of connection into the industry. Um, maybe that as a, as a positioning where I'm coming from and, and um, what my angle is on what could be affirmative practices. And maybe because there was also a, a question uh, last week about the affirmative and you, you mentioned that right now again about uh, going back to Rosie Braidotti's um, term and saying, you know, we don't want to get stuck in negativity, but want to want to form new alternatives. I think that's super important to stress that, that what, what we mean by affirmative to not just get into the positivity and um, rather what say for me, for me, that would mean uh, it's about solidarity and it's about support and it's about bringing people in and bringing people up. So that's maybe as a, as a very specific political statement at the front, <laughs> what I think should, should happen. Um, and now looking at the two different terms um, of the, the theme today, curation and distribution, which I think are super important and interlinked, but distinct things with di distinct mechanisms um, working within the, the industry. Um, so starting with curating, or well, maybe b before I, I differentiate, I'm also going back to, um, and, and we had that in the conversation, Matilda and I yesterday in our little pre-conversation uh, where I already mentioned that I see a lot of discussion happening on feminism, gender equity, diversity, specifically in the realm of production in the last few years, but hardly anything in the realm of distribution um, because that seemed to be different realms and I'm going to come back to that when, when I talk more about distribution um, but it is important to to look at because it's not only about who produces films and what we then see so the the, the representation behind the camera and on screen but also that those films actually get to the screen and that seems to be a thing that's not hasn't caught as much attention as a production site just yet. So that's why I think it's brilliant that we, we look at that angle um, also. Um, so going back into what, what curating 
than there is. So coming from a festival perspective, having worked in festivals and researching festivals, um, I would say looking at, at curation is very important because the festival circuit is all about selection and it's about cultural capital. It, and that's where I would see a difference between curating and distribution, which is usually thought of as commercial distribution. So, so curating and festivals is more about, I would say, symbolic capital, cultural capital. It's about what kind of other films do we present and highlight and, and create buzz, which and visibility through awards and so on, which ideally translates into financial capital, but doesn't have to, right? So it's more the, the artistic side, I would say. Um, and because of that, it is important what is selected and that usually, and that there are not many, but a few um, um, empirical studies on that, it is important what kind of taste uh, regimes curators have. And I would not be so essentialist to say that only, you know, only white males only um, find films or are interested in films by white men. Um, but at the same time, knowing for a long time through feminist, queer, other research um, that cultural background matters. Right? What kind of experiences do I have? What kind of films and what kind of stories can I relate to? Do I find important? That might change what kind of films I select or which I see as important or artistically innovative, right? Because I can connect and it, it, it connects to my canon of taste. So because of that, um, it is, I think important to look at who is on the selection committees. Is it just the same, you know, middle class, well trained, academically trained, or film critic people, or is it also other, I don't know, marginalized filmmakers, for instance? Yeah. So, so that would be one one thing that I found about in curating in terms of being affirmative or inclusive, maybe, or you know, like bringing people in is who is actually in the team who's selecting and, and, and what kind of conversations are there about selection, about the criteria of selection. So that's one thing and I'm sure the other three uh, panelists can speak a lot more and worry well about all the details, how they do that. So then going on to distribution, which, you know, maybe that's very academic, but I would differentiate one is more the artistic realm and a different economy, so to speak, yeah, then the, the financial distribution side where it's about either bumps in seats, like in the cinema, which is very hard now in the pandemic. Now it's people before screens, but, you know, I'm sure Mathilde can talk a lot about the difference of streaming platforms and, and cinema. And um, so what um, has been going on there uh, looking again at, at research that has been happening the last, say, 10 years, or also listening to, to discussions in the industry is a lot about, it's just about quality, right? That in, in theory or in, even in practice, audiences don't care who made the film. It's just about how brilliant, important the film is. And that might be true to some degree, but I feel like there is also more awareness in, in the general society now who, who made a film, whether it's say by a woman or by an other um, represent, underrepresented groups. Um, so, so that's, I think, um, an argument that doesn't hold anymore. That's just about uh, the content quality, but it should also be about who made the films. And there are very few studies about what, like who is actually working in distribution. There is one study by um, Stephen Follows on who's working in sales. He's only looking at gender. So how many uh, women are there? And it's like the rest of the industry, um, the higher up uh, in the in the ranking and in the in the 
power of of decision making you go, the less women are in there. There are no statistics just yet about other forms of discrimination or other categories like race, ethnicity, and so on. At least none that I know um, off the cuff right now. Um, another um, interesting piece uh, of, of research, and I can um, put in the links uh, later in the chat for everybody, um, is um, by Deb Verhoeven and her kinematics team who's looking at um, Showtime data and found out that, you know, we all know there are less films made by women and there's a whole, you know, discrepancy of like in, in the whole um, chain of making films from you have less money for development, you have a smaller budget, the film by definition is usually smaller, it's, it's harder to get into distribution even if you are in, in distribution and that's the key. Even if you are in distribution, at least statistically, for films by women and other minorities, they get shown on less screens, right? So, and that has an impact on what is seen and also what has an opportunity to actually be financially viable. If you start with a lower degree, it's harder to actually be a financial success, right? So those are things I would like to, to, to highlight that really distribution is an important sector and that the, we need a more discussion also about um, equity and inclusion also on that end. And maybe I'm, I'm ending here with that. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you for, um, for this uh, good introduction in the, the panel. Um, so next up is uh, Nadia uh, Dresti. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I mostly agree with, with what Skadi said. But I have a completely different approach because I learned my job by doing it. I didn't go to any cinema school. I don't have any academic background at all. Uh, but I agree in what you said. Uh, in a sense, this is something that I realize now that has been with me always. And I would say two keywords: there are solid female solidarity and resilience. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself, just to understand, you know, because I'm coming to this point of view. I was so lucky to be born in a very small town with 20,000 inhabitants, Locarno, where one of the major festivals in the world is taking place. And uh, when I was around my 20s, because I was in the street, like saying, I don't want to do this, I was against this, you know, instead of going study, I was doing this small job in the summertime, and then I fell in love with cinema because in Locarno, I discovered all these films and I had to discover all these people coming to Locarno for, for all over the world. And since I was at the desk, you know, giving badges and doing the small jobs, I learned a lot, a lot. I met a lot of people. And after a few years, I decided I want to really make a career. In, uh, in, the, in the cinema world, but as very much, I was always attached and curious about the industry side of the cinema. And it was this lady that was in Locarno, she was a member of the selection committee. She was a Turkish lady, journalist, that she married a Swiss guy, and uh, she was running Holy Theater. She was a strong programmer in Switzerland. And since she was coming every year to Locarno, we started to chat and everything. I said, hey, I, I want to move out. And she said, I will help you. And a few months later, I had a meeting at the 20th Century Fox in Switzerland. And I got the job as a, a marketing assistant of the marketing department for Switzerland. For me, it was just, wow, 20th Century Fox, you know, you saw it on screen. And was like, oh, oh, the dream is coming true. The year after I become director of the department and I went to Hollywood. You know, they have this jacket where you have like France, Belgium, Australia, all the marketing department went there. And then 
I realized it was a man world because in my position, there were few other female, but like the executive in Hollywood, they were all men. But I thought, well, that's the way it is, you know, and I was still too young to take a position or something. Well, when I came back from Hollywood, I left the job because I, I, I felt that I didn't want to spend my life to do promotion for the Eddie Murphy films or Bruce Willis films, you know, kind of, I say, well, it's not what I learned in Locarno. And I opened my small company called Zero Problem, so very positive attitude. And I work with all the Swiss distributor um, and Swiss exhibitor at the same time, a Swiss festival, including Locarno, doing press and promotion. And then again, I realized that mainly the festival director at the time, the exhibitor or distributor, they were mainly men. Uh, then I moved to Paris with my small company for private reason. And that Turkish woman called me up and said, do you want to come and work with me? And that lady is Becky Props, the founder of the European Film Market. Uh, in uh, in Berlin. So then I went to Berlin and then really it opened the big world because there, you know, you have not only like the, I had this major world with me, the experience I had Locarno, but Berlin, the market is like, you know, all the buyers, all the industries coming to Berlin. And I was in charge of deciding who was like the receiving which badge or deciding, let's say, uh, analyzing the profile of the distributors from all over the world to like kind of categorize who is more important or not. It's not that Becky didn't know, but I was like going in this profile. And since I was doing the job, I had somebody else that saw what I was doing and that guy was Jerome Payard, the director of Marché de Cannes. So a few months later, I was working for the Marché de Cannes. And in Marché de Cannes, I have the biggest data world, uh, the database in the world. I said, wow, the, the world is so big, you know. And uh, since I, I was having this two position, at the time, director of the Locarno Film Festival was Marco Müller. We are talking about 20 years ago. And Marco Müller asked me to, uh, to launch, to found what was called the industry office, now Locarno Pro which I did it. So in Berlin, I did the uh, espionage industrial, you know, I was copying out the, the best profile uh, buyers, sales agent that would be perfect for Locarno. So the very first year that I did uh, this uh, industry um, days, let's call it, like the perfect buyers and perfect sales agent, they were there. It was that perfect match. It was like bingo, you know. And from there on, uh, the Locarno Pro has grown. Uh, of course, we cannot compare with Berlin or Canada, the real market or Toronto, but still like uh, lately we had 1,500 buyers and sellers and festival programmer, which is very a high number, I think, for like a very cinephile festival. When I started this job 20 years ago, you know, when you are in this position, you start to be invited in all the festival around to represent Locarno, not for selling a selecting film, but to talk about your job or to meet producer or whatever, uh, you know, was going on. And then I've been traveling from, I don't know, from Hong Kong to India, to Colombia, to Los Angeles, everywhere in the world. And then I met, I must say, a lot of strong female in the producer, in the production, uh, in the distribution, in the acquisition, uh, festival director. Still, there are not enough, that's for sure. We are clear, there are not enough. But I see this solidarity uh, between women and as a matter of fact, you know, I just want to point out that now that I'm like not in the office anymore, like I have this international advisor position, uh, I still have this strong relationship, especially with women in the business. And probably because every time that they would meet, I don't know, in Hong Kong or in which festival around the world, 
we would still get together and talk about business and also about personal life, you know, without going to personal, but just like, a, uh, and in this solidarity, I felt like we need to develop that more, you know, because even though the woman had a strong position, sometimes there was always a male above, you know, not always, but sometimes. And uh, the approach, it's always different. It looks like, I don't know, like a, a, a woman probably is less uh, sure about herself all the time. It's just, you know, it's not a question of self-confidence or, or I don't know, or still because there are not enough strong women there that help other women. What can I say that in Locarno now, Locarno Pro, now the person in charge is a, is a man who's a fantastic person because it's very professional. But since I was hiring all the time uh, female and not men, giving the priority to female to work with me, since I was deciding who to hire in my department and Matilde knows better between Sophia and Sara and Daria, now between the open door industry, we have three men and nine women. And there are not assistant to secretary, you know, they are professional. And I think what we can do, you know, to be uh, effective, uh, affirmative, but effective to give the hand to younger generation of female, just like Becky Props did it to me, you know, and I will do it. And as a matter of fact, now all these women that I met around the world, that they were younger or less younger, whatever, uh, we are still in touch and they ask me, you know, maybe some advice or, and I always try to help them. But it's true, you know, we have to admit that in, if I see still strong women in the, in the industry, I don't know, like a few, I don't producer, Christine Vachon from Killer King from New York, or, you know, Diana Elbaum, or big buyers and distribution that we know wherever the world on festival director like Tina and Tina and Italian has been there for many years in Sao Paulo and La Mostra in Rio. We have two women for many years in Vienna too. Now Tabita in Sundance. So there are women. Not enough, let's say, you know, just like uh, still. Uh, what I see is uh, it's really the real problem is in the creativity of the filmmaking. It's true, you know, I mean, even in Locarno, but I will let Matty talk about this because I don't have anything to do with curation. Uh, there are not enough uh, film made by female. And there, it's really a big difference than in the industry. So I want, I want to say if in the industry still, I'm not saying 50-50, but still is growing because there are also more and more female that they start maybe like mean small job. And since it's not a job that you have to, you cannot go to school or learn that. You know, there are no schools. The only way to learn it is either to be a film critic and you do creation or whatever. But if you work in the industry, you know, you learn your job because you get approached and therefore the resilience. You don't have to give up, give up. You have to, of course, you have to be passionate, you know? But for me, I don't have problem to be at the same level to discuss with the big sales agent or like the biggest festival director in the world because I know all of them, you know, with the time going around, of course, they all know me in the good or less, but they know me. So I don't, I don't feel, uh, I feel what I am and, uh, and my question is also, I, I was talking to Miriam about this. I don't know if it's character because I'm kind of shitty character, let's say, you know, strong character and uh, like a man character. It's like, I know what I want and, you know, it's not so easy to, to go around, but I'm open to understand when I'm wrong, of course, you know, I'm not, but I'm, uh, and I don't know if it's like character, it's a point that could be the male or female, or it's just the female normally that are also, as I said, less sure about their films because 
and here I, I finish my small introduction because I think, again, in the industry side, somehow it's easier to make your way out, even though it's through what Scadi said, even now still there are not so many uh, female exhibitor and female distributor, even though there are but not enough. But uh, the female director, there are really not enough. And I really, we have to work on that, especially, not only. That's all for the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you for, thank you for this and, and for all the background, um, yeah, the background information. <laughs> um, I feel that as if you were kind of revealing some of the secrets of the industry in a way. <laughs> uh, but Matil will be able to talk a bit more about this, about films made by women, I guess, and, uh, and curation and distribution. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Maud, for inviting me to join this uh, very profound and uh, very matter of fact uh, panel. So um, I'm French. Uh, my background is in. Um, sales. I worked for eight years at a company called MK2. I was heading the sales and the acquisition. And um, I'm um, the founder with uh, Alessandro Raya of, of three platforms, uh, Festival Scope Pro um, and Festival Scope, which Maud mentioned. And um, together with uh, TV channel Arte, um, the platform Arte Kino, which hosts a festival in December. Um, in parallel to these activities of entrepreneur in the field of the film industry, I'm also a programmer. I've been a programmer for the Sarajevo Film Festival since 2012. Um, and I'm a programmer for the Locarno Film Festival since 2019. Um, this topic of, so my perspective uh, on this approach is definitely curating slightly uh, curating in slightly different ways if we're talking about the platforms and if we're talking about the festivals. Um, it's uh, something that's really important to me. It has, I would say, it has been for a very long time. Um, and my way of living it and uh, acting on it is um, really to highlight uh, the work of women filmmakers uh, on the platforms, uh, let's say first. Um, for Arte Kino, we boast ourselves in a programming that has been 50-50 for a few years now. And uh, it's something that um, I would say is not that hard to accomplish. <laughs> and I'm happy also to say it's not that hard. <laughs> um, but it takes a will. It's uh, something we do together with Olivier Per, um, who's the uh, artistic director of Arte, and uh, something that's really uh, uh, a matter of, yeah. I would say very often when we talk about for programming, we talk about artistic values, and I would say it's values that are beyond the artistic ones. It's really a matter of values like ethics. Um, I mean, to me, I would not program, uh, I would not make a selection 100% of French films, right? It wouldn't make sense. Um, so it's the same, the same diversity goes for, uh, you know, like culturally work in terms of countries, but also expressing uh, themes and also uh, women and male directors. Uh, it's something very important for us. Um, as the platforms are concerned, Festival Scope and Festival Scope Pro, well, it's funny enough, I had to do like the reportings uh, very recently for the 2020 uh, uh, year, like all the financials and things. And it also go through uh, statistics, you know, screening statistics. And I was talking to Scuddy yesterday and uh, just, you know, uh, last week I found out that uh, among the top five films on the, in terms of screenings on the Festival Scope Pro platform. So basically Festival Scope Pro for the ones who don't know what it is, it's a platform, online platform for the industry that allows film professionals to watch films online. Films selected in the major festivals like Locarno, obviously, Sundance, uh, Cannes, uh, Toronto, Venice, uh, I mean, you name it, Sundance. Um, so Berlin, Anna. Um, so it basically reflects in a way partially because it's only films, uh, you know, that we have agreement for and it's not the complete selection of those festivals, but still, you know, it's a way it reflects, you know, what the industry, the state of the industry is. 
And in 2020, out of the five top uh, screened films, four of them were directed by women filmmakers. So that was, you know, that's something, I mean, it happened that it was, there was a year, the Tony Erdmann year, where we had like two uh, films directed by women in the top three. But this year is really special. So, I mean, to me, my perspective is quite optimistic. I really think it's moving in the right direction. Um, uh, so it's, it's again, I, in terms of programming now, I mean, setting aside the platform thing, um, for Sarajevo, we've had this approach of uh, highlighting uh, films directed by women for a very long time. Um, I think to me, what really, uh, is key in terms of programming, and that's not an, a simplistic issue. Um, what has been key to me is the reading of uh, the male gaze by, you know, the famous uh, Laura Mulvey. Um, it's something that uh, has also helped me understand, uh, you know, beyond, you know, the selection committee kind of environment, the whole culture of how we appreciate films. Why do we appreciate westerns? This way, I mean, how the the the, the film lovers, uh, how their gaze has been structured for such a long time, and how important it is to be conscious of it, not totally to reject it, but really to be conscious of it, because it still plays in selection committees nowadays, and regardless of gender, I would say, you know, it's not just male that have a male gaze. Sometimes it's women as well, and that's the trick. So to me, the real thing is really to be conscious of it, because once you're conscious of it, you can, you know, analyze it and then depart from it, or at least take some distance from it. So um, if I want to talk precisely about uh, the selection committee curating approach, um, the two environments are different. For the um, Sarajevo Film Festival, I've been programming it for uh, so almost uh, yeah 10 years, <laughs> um, together with Alessandro Raya, who's also my partner on Festoscope Pro and uh, Festoscope. So we're 50-50, but we're a two-person selection committee for our section in Kinescope, so that's, that's easy. And I would say what has been really important is uh, the center of a discussion is this. I mean, this principle of having like a balanced uh, programming is a given for us and has been for a few years. But we also really um, take very much into consideration this, uh, this approach, this male gaze approach, very often. And once, once you're conscious of it, very often you, you, you can find a very good film in which you know, the women characters are either the mother or the whore, you know, la maman et la putain. And it's, you know, it's sometimes said in a very subtle way, but it's, it's, it's very, very often the case, you know, and so that's very important to be conscious of that and to uh, take some distance from this. For the Locarno Film Festival, um, the selection committee, uh, well, this is my second time um, with a, uh, as a selection committee member. Um, I was first uh, a member of the previous team uh, from 2019, 2020, we didn't really do a program, we, we did a special edition. Um, but um, yeah, so what we did is, uh, is really like to, um, I would say to confront this, what we want from the beginning, because the trick is when you have like a specific uh, set of films, like you can have only 15 films in competition, um, you need to be very, very selective. So you need from the beginning to set the values you want to have. Otherwise, very often you will have way too many films for your selection. And so that's something that has to be conscious as well uh, throughout the programming uh, process and from the beginning. And it has, it, so it's something that uh, it's, a, it's a matter of uh, ethics that uh, is combined with you know, the artistic uh, research of uh, that matches the festival lineup. So it's, it's something that's very important as well. And it's not an easy job to do, but um, I think, uh, well, Skelly was very much uh, to the point mentioning uh, the difference between curation and distribution. And that's something maybe we we'll want to discuss further uh, in the conversation. 
Um, thank you very much. That was um, I, I really I really like this the, the what you drew uh, now about um, joining ethics and, and artistic values. I think that's um, that's an important point that we can discuss further as well later. Um, so Miriam, now you can uh, maybe give your approach. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much for having me and particularly for including me in this session on curation and distribution. Um, truth be told, I do curate, but I got to curatorial work um, by way of writing and teaching. So I, I sort of feel a little bit of a syndrome, uh, you know, an imposter syndrome sharing the table with with these these people that are so competent uh, but anyway I'll try my best to give uh, another angle um, from which we can approach you know uh, these issues um, and thinking about um, curatorial work and the distribution I sort of, sort of um, crystallized three main points that I would like to make today um, so first one is that for me, both curation and distribution are a way of circulating. So, um, you know, be it knowledge, uh, images, products, call them as you like, but it is still a sort of, you know, way of circulating stuff, circulating ideas, visuals, representations and, and all of that. And that is a way of engaging, mobilizing, uh, you talk a little bit, uh, well, more than a little bit, uh, about mobility in your work. And, and to me, it was very much, you know, while reading, that was kind of inspiring because I thought, obviously, when I do curate, um, my, my aim is, you know, hopefully um, make visible more work and uh, more films and particular approaches from filmmakers that I deem, you know, valuable. So obviously it's a way of, of engaging for me, hoping other people will engage with those films and mobilizing them, basically passing on a message to someone else. Uh, so these to me are all profoundly affirmative practices, uh, if I think of them, uh, because they stand for what you call willful, right? These are willful acts for me. So it's something that, you know, um, talking to the artists, for example, trying to, to, to make encounters happen. And I was really struck when Nadia was talking, her story is a wonderful story of encounters and, and meeting people. And that's exactly how it, you know, how it works. So my experience is, is absolutely, you know, shorter and probably less exciting, never been to Hollywood, uh, but, um, but obviously it's about encountering people and meeting people. And I suppose the fact that we are here today comes from the fact that we met and we had something to, to talk uh, about, to, to share, to pass on one another. So I, I appreciate it's very abstract, but, but to me, it's really important to keep that you know, very basic um, aim, very alive and, and, and there every time I, I do approach the curatorial project. Uh, and then the second thing I would like to say is that um, even though this might seem a little bit abstract and philosophical, um, it is in fact very concrete because all these these things that we do when we try to engage, to mobilize, to pass on messages, to uh, circulate, um, you know, meanings, uh, in fact, is very much about appropriating relations and dynamics that belong to a particular system, which is the systems we are in. And it is very concrete. It's something we live every day in whatever uh, kind of um, environment, professional environment we are active. So um, as an academic, um, I do feel very much that I am part of a system and I have to cope with it and to, you know, sort of act within it uh, every single day. Uh, so it's not necessarily bad, but obviously it's there. It's the baseline. We need to sort of, I don't know, probably increasingly with time, I'm, I'm thinking it is very important to be aware of it. And it can be also a good starting point to make things happen. It's not necessarily something we have to fight. 
can be useful sometimes in a way. <laughs> um, so obviously this doesn't mean that I'm not acknowledging it is horribly hierarchical. Uh, it is very unequal. It is mostly constraining. Uh, it is patriarchal. Uh, and yet I think there are structures that we can use for purposes that um, are not aligned with these systems. So in a way, I suppose in this sense, every time I approach a curatorial note that I want to write, and I see that there are a couple of partners in crimes of, of mine in the participants, so maybe they can join the conversation later on. Um, every time I approach a, a screening program or every time I walk in the classroom and I you know, have a lecture to, to deliver, or every time I even send out a proposal for a publication, it's something that I am doing, building um, in my own tiny way, a little bit of that system in a different way, in an affirmative way. Um, so in a way, I suppose there are micro political stances that we can make in everything we do. And this is not to get a load or to overload too much what, what we do, but I suppose that's exactly what Mathilde was describing. There are some choices that are, you know, uh, have impact and can make the difference. So I suppose I like to think about the choices I have to make um, very mindfully. Um, so I don't know, it's a way to believe into the micro side of things to, to inhabit my world actively and affirm affirmatively. So this doesn't necessarily mean to protest uh, vocally sometimes, uh, even if that is very liberating when it happens. Um, but um, yeah, I suppose it is legit, but this is the, not the only one, uh, not the only way of actually making, you know, strong stances. So I, I recall uh, probably it was the last seminar, um, someone uh, was saying that, uh, Feminism can be quiet uh, and can be sort of, you know, there are not, there, there was a conversation where someone said, uh, yeah, and then you are a feminist, but then you have to do it the right way, right? That is in itself for me uh, a very, very strong contradiction in terms. We cannot afford having a, a, a right or a wrong way. We need all ways. Um, and so for me, I suppose I embrace the quiet way, uh, but that's, that's me, that's the personal <laughs> way to go. And I very much uh, feel comfortable going the humble way as well. Um, I don't think it is less effective than a very vocal uh, one. Oops, sorry. Um, I don't know, I suppose it kind of, um, gets back to and leads me to the last point I wanted to make. Um, probably observing a lot and, and trying to, to find a way in the folds of the system um, is what allows me to, to sort of um, be more mindful and, and be able to have a, you know, to, to ex express um, what we teachers call uh, duty of care. And I think when it comes to curatorial work, there's a lot of duty of care involved. Um, so I, again, I guess that's the educator hat being, uh, you know, more, more waiting more now on my head. Um, but that never falls off. I realize that hat never falls off in everything I do, even when I am you know, trying to write the writer hat or the curator hat, and still always uh, a little bit of, of an educator, I'm afraid. Um, so in a nutshell, I suppose that being that um, is practicing a duty of care. So it's something, when we talk about that, when we talk about duty of care, it's not something that we 
we read in you know um, famous universities guides book and and that's it or maybe most of the times it can be like that but i do believe very strongly that it is something we can practice in a very very concrete way and it is something that you practice when you curate as well so um, that comes along obviously with responsibility it is not an imposed responsibility it is a responsibility that is purposeful, uh, which is not always easy to take, but certainly joyful. And here, I suppose that there is a lot of affirmative um, acts uh, coming, coming along. It is possibly fulfilling. It is very much um, rooted in, you know, uh, in the idea that you make choices and you are, you know, carrying. Um, you know, uh, those choices joyfully because you decided very purposefully to, to do something and not doing something else, to include a program, uh, a film in a program and not another, to focus on one filmmaker and not another, to pick a particular um, venue to, to propose your program and not another. And maybe it's not the richest one, but that's the right one for that program for that screening, for those uh, visuals, those meanings that you desperately want to circulate. So, um, yeah, I believe that programming a certain film means to stand for what that film has to say. Uh, and at the same time, publishing in a certain frame is an affirmation of what that frame stands for. So, you know, that, that's how you pick a particular um, journal or critical text uh, rather than another. And that's probably the same with lecturing, lecturing that film instead of another one. Uh, it's not just, it, it's also a way of circulating meaning, of producing meaning, and hopefully empowering people to, to, to produce meaning themselves. Um, so, yeah. All these things are to me occasions to make um, a decision, to enjoy that decision making process, uh, to give to me, you know, uh, the thrill of making that decision and not another, if you like. Um, and I'll say this probably explains why, um, what is curatorial work for me, it's just very personal, but I just throw it there in case there are you know, <laughs> important or, or relevant aspects on it. Um, it's, it's really like um, curatorial activity that is limited and it is very independent, but I want it to be limited and independent because this allows me to make those choices. I was just talking a minute ago um and probably sort of work within the system uh or the institutions or the bodies that i have to interface with in this work um so these are all ways of, of making research for me these are uh, all ways to um sort of build up and articulate a particular stance a particular perspective to act willfully if you like um so i don't know it's it i see these these different activities as parts feeding each other uh building up one discourse that is uh, a unique discourse really um and that is particularly a shared discourse as much as possible it is a committed discourse it is a collective discourse which takes me back to the idea of solidarity that uh some of you were were talking about um yeah i suppose i will just end my uh, short chat um on this on this point there is an amazing film um uh, by um american experimental animator and friend kelly gallagher um entitled uh, from a lie to accomplice which is very dear to me. And I have to thank Greg, which I think is here uh, for making me encounter that film. Um, I think that film sums it up well, this sense of, of solidarity and the sense of what I am trying to say here, 
it is not by mildly sympathize um, with particular ideas that we can sort of affirm them, uh, but rather embracing them. Uh, I think that is the best way to see affirmation unfolding. And Kelly's way of doing it sort of, um, I don't know, it resembles very much um, the attitude, uh, a very intelligent and smart attitude to do that uh, because she employs uh, pop aesthetics. She, um, she uses and combines cutouts, collaging, glittery backgrounds, very colorful and flashy uh, aesthetics. But she does that to discuss radical and uh, political contents that are very important. So probably um, resembling visually much of the attitude I hope I managed to uh, describe earlier. I suppose that real struggles can come in very glittery and flashy and apparently light ways and still being very important and very radical. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Those were uh, wonderful words that I think really um, encompassed everything that has been said so far, which, uh, yeah, I think you, you did a, a very good job at being last, actually. <laughs> um, so I, I, I really would like to come back to this, uh, to this idea of, um, of, of a, com a combination of artistic and ethics, and I think that that all come um, come through your um, your presentations today, of um, admitting people, admitting people in, and and choosing them purposefully, uh, for both for um, um, maybe for what we expect them to present, and also for um, and also for what they have to present and, and the artistic value that they uh, that they bring. But I'm kind of torn uh, in this uh, idea of how much does a cultural background um, matter? Um, because as so Skadi Loist had this idea of, OK, we need to look at the cultural background. And I, I do agree we need more diversity. But Mathilde also said, well, Yes, but even women can have a very misogynistic kind of gaze. So how can we actually reconcile this opposition? Because I think there is an opposition, but at, at the same time, it is within the system we live in. We've all been grown and raised by um, in, in a kind of racist, patriarchal um, uh, society. So how do we fight this? I don't know if, um, yeah, uh, who would want to? Y yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll try. Because um, I, I made a few notes while Miriam was saying, because I can really relate a lot to the, the um, comment of the system. I'm going to try to to arc back into that, but first come uh, start with your question more of you know this whole account, um, the, the the term of cultural background maybe making clear again that while I find that super important um, also stress that I find important not to read that as essentializing right so that while I on the one hand would always argue that, um, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, class are very important and need to be represented that I would never say one-on-one -on -one just because there are more women, that means they select more women or that they are all, you know, uh, following or championing or even acknowledging a female gaze, whatever that is even, what is a female gaze, right? So, so that is super important to me and it seems a conundrum, but you know, there are categories that matter in real life and that I find super important as, you know, as experience based, very cultural studies logic maybe. Um, but at the same time, not trying to argue that is a one-on-one -on -one 
result in any way, right? Like just like um, just because more women are, I'm saying more women should make films or more queer people should make films or more um, non-white people, people of color should make films doesn't mean that I assume that the women make films about women in a particular way or that queer people are supposed to make films about queer people or that people of color are only making films that are one dimensional about race. They should not. They should not be expected to, right? So that's two things that are, I think, complicated to connect. On the one hand, it's the it's the industry and who is working there who gets access to work in that field with their experiences bringing in. And what are the stories we tell and who tells them? And that should not be, you know, directly linked causal connection. So that's two different things that I find super important um, on that. Um, and coming back to the system, um, if I may, um, from what, what Miriam was saying, kind of like, we are working in a system, and maybe that's for us even stronger, working in an academic system. Um, but I see that also in, in, the, in the film or larger media industries as a certain kind of system. And I'm gonna give you an example. Two days ago, we had the press conference for a um, study on diversity in film in, in the film industry in Germany that just came out. It's the first study that tries to get empirical information on who is actually working in the industry and not just based on gender, but every category. So they asked for disability, um, sexuality, gender identity, um, so-called migration background, because that's a legal term in Germany uh, where you can't really um, talk about race. So all those categories were looked at and uh, what, what came out um, was that um, all people, uh, like, like along every category, um, those um, people are marginalized and underrepresented compared to um, the representation or the, 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 the number in our actual society, right? There are less women working there, less um, people of color, less uh, queer people, usually in all departments. And also, again, um, like I said in the, in the studies before, usually the higher you get in the decision-making chain, um, the, the less of so-called underrepresented groups are in there. And another thing, so that's maybe not even, you know, that's maybe not even news or we did expect that. Another thing that is quite shocking um, because it was asked um, to reflect on the last two years in the industry, what their experiences were on discrimination. And a huge number said they feel discrimination either based on gender, sexuality, or race, right? It's like basically what that shows is that the system, it's systemic racism and systemic sexism that is pervasive in the industry so that is a real issue right like not and and there i would i would disagree with miriam that saying um you know quiet feminism um does the trick i guess i would be the one saying yes but not enough <laughs> like you have to call it out to then hopefully inspire a change in the larger industry in terms of saying it's not just people thinking there is discrimination, but it is there and we have the numbers. And now really go look at it and ask yourself, do you wanna work in this kind of unfair industry or do you wanna actively change it? Or um, like um, what, what Matilda and I were talking about yesterday also about the gaze, right? Like who's looking at what kind of and who's recognizing what what kind of canon have we grown up with i think it's also about you know 80s term awareness raising really like talk about 
what what is it that we that we see or don't see and really like what is it that we don't see and just start that process of realizing i'm not perfect either like i have my preconceptions and i've been working in that field for decades now but still continue looking at ourselves very critically like where are we not doing the job good enough how can we help also in the academy, for instance, like uh, bring up more um, people of color, for instance, and not just women and not, and also not count that against each other. Like really, it's not about either uh, people of color or gender or um, sustainability and ecology, it's all connected. And that's, I think the, what it makes so hard to really get through um, to people and and try to tackle it from all sides and not, and, and be resilient, like Nadia said. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so that's my long answer, sorry. No, no, thank you, thank you for this. Uh, is there anyone else who would um, comment on this? Maybe I just want to add something. Um, since I said I'm not coming from the academic world or the Croatian world, and I'm coming from the other one, I think it's very good now, even though it's like unbearable, unbearable that is coming up now, and we are still talking about, you know, it's just like, uh, but all these studies and analyses that everybody's doing that are so important, you know, because finally, even Eurimage now has like the, you know, the gender equity new model. And as you, Scadi said, it's not just question of uh, gender, it's a question of integration, it's question of inclusion, you know. And it's crazy, I think that we are still talking about like Black Lives Matter. Of course, Black Lives Matter, of course. I mean, we are still at this point. Therefore, you know, I think these words that came up now, maybe they are like meaningful because awareness is the, the right word to add to solidarity and resilience because we have to be aware of the situation and we have to make people aware of the situation. And in the way we approach that, as I said, I have a different approach because what I did Affirmative, I was hiring women and following women because I had the chance to be helped by the woman or driven by the woman. And everybody has to get his own way to get there, you know. But it's so important to be aware, as you and you, Miriam, said, you know, because it seems like we forget, you know, these years. If we are still talking about this now, it's just like the human being is just like like a machine, you know, it's just like, I don't get it. But of course, we all know that we have to find the, the right approach, you know, in, with the curation or with the with industry, whatever, we have to talk more. And I think, and I want to really thank more to put up this panel, because, you know, it's very important for us to talk together and to talk to the other one. In the approach for me, I'm like more the Miriam approach, go out and just say, hey, you know, it's just, I want to see something else. Or, you know, it's not, I think it's very difficult if you go and try to fight now, especially in this moment when everybody's really, really you know, with this crisis, economic crisis that is going around with the cinema closing and everything, probably it's the moment to try to change something. And we have to find all together the approach. I don't have the solution, but I think we are all very aware and we have to try to bring this awareness to you know, the key players or the, the decision makers. So. I think there is actually, a, yeah, Emily maybe here. Yeah. yeah, there's a question from the, um, from the chat from Valentina, who says, I'm a film historian, theorist and curator. I teach film in a university in London. Many of my students no longer identify as male or female, and yet their reference points in cin cinema are nearly exclusively and tacitly male, be it in the choice of the film or directors in terms of the gaze, or in the production role they choose to take up. 
as a distributor or curator, how to address this generation for whom feminism is a nebulous word and gender a contested ground? To the panel. <laughs> I'm not a distributor, but maybe <laughs> what I could I could say about this. Um, I don't know. It come, comes back to what Scotty was saying about that report that was presented. It's not just one cause or one territory that that contests the other. It's all of them together. So clearly, it is a contested ground because it's because it's is a mess. It's a chaos. And obviously for someone that um, you know, is, is studying film and probably need to take uh, you know, uh, decisions, obviously uh, in terms of um, what roles to take up and um, how to orientate uh, within this nebulous um, world. Um, I suppose, yeah, um, being aware of, of, of the different positions is for me most definitely the first step and being aware that there are different problematics and that they're all present all together as you know as, as scary as they might be it's not just representing uh, one identity uh, over another or one issue over another it's all of them together so I suppose that grasping this is multiplicity, this complexity is, is very much what we could do as educators or uh, what we can uh, do by choosing one film or another as, as we program. Um, I suppose, I don't know, this needs to be reflected in these choices, even if it's not an easy reality to reflect. I don't know whether this makes sense at all, but... <laughs> Yeah, I, th I do think it. Yeah, it does. It does make sense. It's about the. Well, it, it is as you said about choices, and and you did you, you did say that as well a lot, and emphasize this uh, duty of care. I like this this phrasing, um, and 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 this idea of solidarity and duty of care, or or making people aware of the systemic um, systemic exclusion. Um, and also at the same time, including them or admitting them in, I think it's very important. Um, and, and films, I think, have a, a, an important role to play in this, uh, in, in creating, creating this admission in a way or creating, um, yeah, by showing on screen that other options are possible then being female or male, for example, in the case of um, what Valentina was um, mentioning. Yes, we have a question from Enver. Uh, he says, I have a question regarding the decolonization and feminist views in the film industry. I'm just guessing that in some parts of the world, like in India and Nigeria, which have strong film industry, how could the feminist interjection into film industry progresses? Any thoughts on intersectionality on feminism and film industry? Also, I believe that socioeconomic disparities impacts the feminist and gender-based movements. Hence, this impacts adversely the film industry in some areas of the world. Is there anybody who'd like to comment there? Well, personally, I don't have the answer, but what can I say? Uh, it's, I think somehow, now or never, you know, because now is the moment where all the paradigma are lost, where everything changed, uh, not just because of the pandemic, but because, you know, all the, uh, with the digital and everything, everything has changed. We used to have a certain quantity of films. Now we produce a lot of films, much more than ever. This is worldwide. And it means, and even the festival, we used to have festival and now we have festival everywhere in the world. So everything blow up, you know, somehow. And 
even this the system of the industry I was made was it used to be like a script writer or director to write a story, shoot the film, find the producer, then find the sales agent or a festival that show the films. The sales agent sells the film to the different territories and the exhibitor choose the film and the public going to see the films. Now with the platform, you know, where is the public that goes see a film and theater or in which platforms that see the film and the flat platform ads are producing films. And with all of this mess, here we are in the pandemic where everything stops. So for me, it's kind of the end of the world, you know, and somehow we should take advantage of the situation and because the system, the industry cannot go back in the way it was. It's impossible. It's impossible. So I think this is the right moment to find a way again, I don't know which way, but to make people understand that we have to change, be more inclusive and everything. But, you know, I was just having this picture of me that this is the moment where we don't know what is going to happen with our film. Who, who do we produce film for? Who is going to see the films? You know, when the theater are closed, when uh, uh, the festival stop, of course, things will restart like before, but it will change because many distributors are like bankrupts, you know, like a producer, they don't produce smaller film anymore because they cannot make a living anymore because the competition is so high. Even talking with uh, Roberto Olla from Eurimage, you know, he says that on, even here at the Federal Office of Switzerland, the number of the project that they receive is much higher. Doesn't mean much higher quality. The good films have been there always, but doesn't mean that there are better films or more female films or more whatever films, you know. And therefore, I think somehow, and again, I let the word to other people because I don't have the answer, but I think this is the moment to keep talking about and come up with some solution with the decision makers uh, and normally the decision makers are the, the fund, you know, that they give the money to, like in Switzerland, the federal office help not only the developing the, 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 but also the production and also the distribution uh, and this is real to be brought uh, uh, outside Switzerland. So, all this system is good, but finally, uh, who is going to see all these films? You know, I think we have to rebuild the whole industry uh, because what has been done before, it's uh, it won't go back in that same way. So again, sorry, I don't have the answer, but I think we are. This is the right moment to to uh, ask us this question. I wonder, Mathilde, maybe if you could talk a bit about this, um, about about your point of view from, um, yeah, a curator point of view. Um, yeah, towards this question and also towards how you practically uh, reconcile ethics and artistic values or not reconcile is not the right term, but how do you combine this um, in your decision making? Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, I think it's at the core of programming right now, uh, especially when uh, you have such a, a strict selection, um, like when you have to watch so many films. I can't remember exactly the statistics, but I think we have to watch over thousands of films and make a selection of uh, 15 in a uh, competition, I mean, for Lucano, 15 in a uh, competition, um, maybe 15, 17 in the uh, first filmmakers competition. And then, um, yeah, uh, roughly the same number for the Piazza Grande, which are more the commercial films um, with a distributor and eight in out of competition. I'm just saying the numbers to, to give a sense of how hard the selection is, um, which means, I mean, if you don't start off programming with very clear values, 
uh, at one point, anyway, there are too many good films. So you will have to face it at one point. You take like a very good film, but it's from a region that is already overrepresented in your programming from, you know, a, a filmmaker that, uh, you know, would, you know, change your balance or it's another film from a, a, a European male director, let's say. Um, you know, it's, it's, so that's why I think this question starts from the really beginning when you, when you start your programming and you have your selection committee um, uh, first meeting. Um, because at one point you're always tempted to say, no, come on, it's a very good film. We have to have it. And then, you know, you negotiate with your values. So that's, uh, I think that's the, 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 the whole trick of, of programming. So you have to stand firm on your values. I mean, to me, that's just the complexity of the job. The values are artistic values. Um, they are also uh, ethical values. Uh, there are political values. What are the stories you're telling? What, it, what does it say about the world? Um, uh, it, it's, that's why uh, this job is so interesting and so rich and so complex. If it was simple, it, would, it wouldn't really, it's not just watch films. We watch films from uh, very different regions. Um, so from India and from Algeria and and I, I would say, of course, it the the, the stories uh, we receive, um, or you know, the gender of the filmmakers differ from regions to regions. I don't have the statistics uh, here, but I imagine we receive more. No, it's not even true. Actually, we receive also uh, in the submissions many films from uh, women directors from India as well. Um, but, you know, I think, I mean, I might be a bit too full of hope, but I think the trend is really um, nice because there's a shared uh, will to go for more inclusive programming. And I think that's kind of new because before, you know, it was like, no, I just want to select good films. That was the answer of programmers, right? I mean, you know, the ones we know from the city in the south of France. And now I think it's, it's, you know, something that can't be said, you know, it's just, of course, we want more films, you know, from women filmmakers and from filmmakers from different parts of the world, and we want to be more inclusive. So I think this is a really good step ahead, but it's just the beginning of the process. And I think it goes back also to the question uh, about, you know, the history of cinema that uh, uh, was mentioned uh, earlier on. It's, how come our references are mainly male? <laughs> because, you know, it's, we have to do this job of programming and highlighting because programming is giving a chance of, uh, of an incredible window uh, and an incredible, you know, message of hope for the new generation of filmmakers because, you know, they, they, they can, you know, women filmmakers, they can, I mean, women can dream about being filmmakers, not about being actresses. You know, I, it sounds cliche maybe, but you need very strong examples and you need to have uh, women, uh, you know, on stage uh, directing success, successful films. And so, yeah, I think there's all this work of maybe not revisiting the past, but highlighting uh, women filmmakers that in the past were maybe overshadowed. I don't know, there's this excellent blog called Another Gaze um, that's uh, also, uh, doing an incredible job in this, you know, kind of approach uh, from the history of cinema and uh, enabling us to discover women filmmakers that were somehow, like in many fields of our society, overshadowed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, that would be my answer to the multiple kind of uh, questions about this. Um. Maud, you're, you're on mute, but I'm I'm lip reading that I can just say, <laughs> um, like to, to that uh, same question still. Um, um, maybe I would have a more academic answer or um, position, because um, I I'm wondering um, when we talk about decolonization and feminism in the film industry. And then we mentioned India and Nigeria, but 
we look at who's sitting here, we're speaking in Europe, uh, mostly Europeans. Emily is the Australian in residence. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, I wonder about perspective and about, you know, maybe that's like very academic to look at that, but I think there's a difference between global and transnational, for instance, and also looking at where, what our position is and what our view is of what film industry is. And I'm, you know, I might be wrong, but my hunch is that we are very based in a Western, Western European, maybe Northern America biased idea of what film industry is. And my feeling having researched film festival, the film festival world for over 15 years now is that that is part of the industry that we see that most or you know, we maybe that's, you know, who's we, but speaking from a, from a European perspective within industry and distribution and festival world, there seems to be a certain standard or a, a position where canons and taste um, are positioned and set as a certain standard. And then it's about, when we talk about inclusion, is it inclusion into those standards? Or should we also look at what does feminism mean? What does film industry mean in other parts of the world? And from, from my comparative research, I've learned that film industry is not film industry. And there might be the same sexist problems, but the way it's playing out in the different industries and practicality doesn't necessarily mean they're the same or you can tackle it always in the same ways because, you know, the society around works different because funding structures work different because whatever, you know, different reasons. So, so I would just, and I don't have a good answer for that either, but I, my, my feeling is that what feminism means and what something like diversity might mean for us doesn't necessarily have to be the same, say, in Nigeria or India, and that we just need to be aware of that because we can probably not tackle that because this multi-perspectivity is an issue that we need to be aware and basically talk with other people and try to come to an understanding there and, and really try to think what is the center of what is the standard and what are other centers, other perspectives where, you know, what is true in those industries. Great, I think this is a very, um, very important point and um... And and I'm I'm actually really yeah sad and concerned that my that my panel is only represented by white women of course um, and from the Western um, world so um, yeah we do have to make an active um, make an active job in both in academia and in the film industry at um, are including uh, people from different parts of the world with different realities. And as you said, it's not about including them in our standards, but it's about hearing different voices and, and hearing how it's done differently. Um, and I think that it can also bring us an incredible, an incredible richness about um, how our models have been constructed by binaries and how they see it maybe completely differently and that we have maybe no idea even though we watch a lot of films from different parts of the world, but we do have to include people also from um, a more reflective background maybe. And in academia as well is particularly, um, yeah, European and North American centered. And um, yeah, and when I, when I chose the, the panel, it's also because of what I found and, and I'm concerned that I didn't find anything else, but I, it is because of, I'm looking from a particular lens and I think this lens has to change um, so yeah um, there is yeah there is a comment in the chat but it's not really a question um, 
but Valentina Vitali mentioning a special issue devoted to uh, contemporary women filmmakers in South Asia. Um, and because it opened, uh, because of the work uh, by Open Doors in Locarno. So that's great. Um, and um, yeah, we, it was, sorry. We do, have a, we do have a question in the Q and A yeah. uh, from Christina, which might be a good one to read now. Uh, so Christina says, thank you so much for this discussion. Echoing the first question, I wonder about the importance of including in such discussions discussion beyond the male-female relationship. How might more space be given to acknowledge gender as a spectrum and as fluid and also changing? I wonder also how various community filmmaking approaches, independent DIY, DIO, do it ourselves with others, practices, queering, decolonizing gazes might contribute to empower more diverse stories to be made and celebrated. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this, especially from a distribution curation perspective. Does anybody who'd like to answer? Scarby, thank you. No one else is volunteering. Um, um, maybe, um, bringing in an anecdote or more like his historical comment because like I said I've been working with film festivals and that was um, mostly in the realm of queer film festivals right LGBTQ queer film festivals that are mostly working in a volunteer based activist and DIY settings because of the way where they come from, the way funding goes, um, because of the, the political ideals that they work in. And um, coming from that perspective, I see how basically what we've said before is also very true to look at ethics and look at in inclusion or look, look at awareness of what your values are in organizing an event and inviting certain kinds of films and filmmakers to, to say, maybe one example, the, the, the oldest still existing biggest uh, queer film festival in the world, Frameline in San Francisco started uh, 42 years ago um, as a little event where, you know, filmmakers, um, started uh, to show films of their friends and realized there's a there's a big um, echo when people want to see it and it grew further and further became a pretty big um, organization that also works year round and started uh, with a little distribution arm uh, with festivals but also um, in the educational sector and so on and in the 90s um, they also had that a discussion of including women or in that case lesbians because they realized you know everything we talked about a uh, few women in the industry even less in the, in the queer sector um, if you want to take that community of uh, at the time gays then gays and lesbians then lgbt now lgbtqi plus um you know take seriously who is supposed to be part of that community and should be represented. And they also were like, well, there aren't any films by lesbians. And then someone was like, yeah, except there are, that's not good enough to say it's hard to find them. You have to go out and look for them more. So they started already in the late eighties, early nineties to say, we need a special programmer who's looking into specifically that. And then later had a, the lesbian programmer later a programmer of color to to say we actively want to look and not just see what's coming in that's one thing and the other thing like trying to reach out to a certain community right like to have build bridges into communities to go to them invite them actively um, and say, well, if we have a programmer of color who comes from that filmmaker community, him or herself, that might be easier to actually reach the demographic we want. 
So I think that those are mechanisms that have been in place for decades that um, would also be working in the larger arena. And I think that are also employed more and more, like looking at the Programmer of Colors Collective, for instance, um, you know, like with, with many programmers of also the, the big festivals working in Tribeca, Sundance, uh, Berlinale, and so on. So there are, there is awareness and there are mechanisms that are picked up. And I think that come or relate to those um, um, also queer decolonizing DIY communities and practices. Any other intervention on this or? No, I kind of feel that um, the uh, it, it's true. What, I mean, I think it's very important what Scotty was pointing out. Different festivals have different systems in place also to kind of acknowledge uh, data on the film submitted. I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, like when you submit to Tribeca or Sundance, um, you know, the festival also have, have has this really specific, um, you know, kind of, um, picture of, okay, let's say we have 40% of films that have been submitted that come from people of color. We have 57% of films that come from women director. We have 32% uh, of film coming from people that don't want to be identified as this gender or that kind of thing. I think in Europe, I mean, I feel we're a bit late on this. I mean, in terms of, you know, having like specific data. I don't know if it's like what Skelly was mentioning, if it's because of our past or if it's just because of our culture. Uh, but I, I think the difference uh, between uh, the US festivals and our festivals in Europe is, uh, is, 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 is major on this field. And therefore, uh, you know, in terms of affirmative actions, uh, in terms of programming that one festival would actually um, take. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's one uh, very important uh, aspect of it. Mm. I, I, was I just want, I'm sorry. No, go on. No, I just want to add maybe that it's true that if we look at like Mathilde knows the industry as well as I know that it's, it's like very much uh, male, uh, white male heading everywhere, cells and you know, everywhere. And uh, I think the big change came uh, a couple of years ago when finally the Oscar went to Moonlight. And I think, you know, since the industry is watching the industry and the, you know, the leader of industry is Hollywood, you know, either we want to or we don't want to, you know, when we talk about business. Uh, and I'm very glad to to see these changes in Hollywood probably become the, they come from political reason. But now it's clear like this year, also a female uh, film is been like, probably is gonna get the Oscar. So it's like these signs, you know, coming from the very highest place, I'm not saying it's the best place, you know, but politically and uh, economically are those ones that still, decide and I think this is a very good sign again you know and uh, we can just learn from that and all the festivals should be more at least you know if you can you can not only create films and having inclusion with the creation but also who you are going to award which juror are you going to choose you know there are different ways of positioning this awareness in our festival and around the world, so. I think there is also an important work to be done about not um, ghettoing uh, or not, not ghettoing films within this category of, of films made by women or films made by people of color, but rather really have a, a diverse, um, a diverse industry and a diverse selection of films um but which is which is really hard by because of of how we've been constructed in this way of of separating people in categories and then 
of actually ghettoing films as women's film and women's cinema, which has been around for a long, long time. And, and I think I, I found this very, very problematic um, because it's not di diversifying the, the canon. It's actually creating a, a side industry, a margin, a, again, another marginalized category in a way. Um, and, and I was wondering, uh, yeah, Mathilde, you wanted to say something about this. And I was also wondering actually, and uh, um, how you, how you relate or how you, you think about the audience when you think about how, which films to select and, and what are the audience of uh, Locarno expecting um, compared to what you want to offer? Is there kind of discrepancies there? Yeah, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> relate to what you were saying first. Like, I think to me, what is really important is to really like uh, be aware or be conscious of what is the main, what is mainstream. And that's, that's really the basic of it all, because after you are conscious of what is super mainstream, basic, uh, you know, kind of in our culture, then you can take uh, all the distance and all the freedom and all the welcoming attitude you are able to to welcome other film filmographies, regardless of you know specific gender, identified gender, and welcoming other cultures and other stories, and so on. I think what is really uh, troublesome is the core of the approach of thinking, oh, a commercial film or a film that has an audience is that kind of film because it sets that kind of standards, the pretty actress, the, uh, the very valorous and courageous male, and the actress being in love with the guy. I mean, all those stereotypes that we can still find at different degrees of, um, of subtleties in films. Um, and, and to me, it's really about educating the image and the approach and understanding that it's at the heart of our culture because, you know, I mean, I, as a mother, I have uh, three kids. I want them to understand cinema. So my perspective is this one. Do I show them films from the past? Which one? The, what, what is the perspective? What is the, the relation between the male character and the female character? I think you need to, because it's part of our heritage, but you need to give it a context, you know, to kind of say, okay, that was the ref that was the main culture. You know, now let's say what it says in terms of standards and how we have taken, how we're taking a long road from it and how we let the margin being at the center. I think in terms of programming, it's the same. I mean, it's really, uh, it's a really intellectual pleasure, uh, but it's a, a really constant awareness. And to me, this is, you know, the, the it's really at the heart of how we can program uh, in a fair way and letting other film, film, filmatographies uh, be highlighted. I mean, it's really, really important to me. And what was the second part of the question? This oh, yeah, yeah, I mentioned audiences. Uh, audiences oh, yeah. in Locarno. In Locarno. Mm -hmm. So in Locarno, this is like, I mean, both in Locarno and Sarajevo, it's something that uh, is such a pleasure. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing audience in, in Locarno. I mean, they have, uh, they are hungry film lovers. They are very generous film lovers. They accept fragile piece of, uh, of work. They, um, they welcome uh, generous uh, ideas. I mean, it, it's a really, I have to say, um, I mean, I think at least us, the programmers, we have this perspective. So that gives us lots of freedom to consider this. <laughs> Maybe it's not true, <laughs> but it's what you, we think and it helps us for programming. Um, I think programming is, uh, is, is, is such a, uh, it's such a thrill compared to, you know, we were mentioning distribution. Distribution is a totally different world. You have to make money uh, or, you know, you just close your business. Um, I think the audience has to be treated with respect and 
fair enough they are curious people so i think i always think about you know this kind of marketing case i had once i was a student a student about this monospace this car that is absolutely doesn't fit any car standards that is like a, 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 a hybrid between a van and a car and how you can't ex you have to offer something to the audience and expect them to react positively even if they don't expect the the, the product it's the same for the car as for the film. I think you have to program trusting also your audience in their ability to welcome films. You can't program your, your audience thinking, oh, they will like a specific kind of films. Otherwise, you not only do is it not respectful with the audience, but it's not respectful to yourself. And it's just conservative programming, which is something like you should then change job, I think, um, especially now. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I really, uh, I'm, I'm really super hopeful in, uh, in the audience. They, they embrace, uh, difficult subjects. They embrace very different filmatographies. When you see, for example, someone was mentioning open doors. When you see the screenings of open doors in Locarno, everyone is, you know, queuing outside They're They're hungry. To, they have an appetite for discovery that is just wonderful. You know, they don't know the filmmakers, there is no cast and they just go and they sleep maybe while watching the film, but then it's a nice sleep and it's a creative one. I don't know. I just want to add Mathilde exactly what I was saying about Open Door. Open Door is a program, uh, mostly they say it's an industry program to choose a region and invite some producer and director to meet like other producers from around the world. And we did it for like Africa. Uh, we did it for uh, different countries. And now we are focusing in Southeast uh, Asia. And as Mathilde was saying, you know, on top of having these industry activities, because we invited the, the, the director from the region and the producer, we show some films. And the open door section is one of the most followed because people are keen to discover this new world. And I think the public is curious, you know, and we have to listen to them. And uh, again, look at, as you said, it's like 30, 60, 360 degrees programming because with the piazza, which is more mainstream too. But it's really interesting to see how the open door prog program, even when we did a like country like Kazakhstan or whatever, they really, went there every single day because they discovered a completely new region and it was fantastic. So the public is smart and curious. And actually there's, I think there's someone who programmed for Locarno Black Light in oh. the participants. Greg <laughs> should actually. Yeah, there. yeah I think he's in the participants room. <laughs> Miriam, you wanted to intervene? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that I, I agree 100% with what Matilda was talking about, uh, if I think about the students. So I, um, I probably don't have uh, the, the, the chance to program for big festivals like Locarno, but in my small experience of, you know, picking what, I don't know, 100, um, you know, students will, will watch, that is also very important, um, you know, uh, ground. To, to sort of act the colonizing as much as possible and, and not working within constraints. So they are, the, I mean, it's always good to see that the, the less, um, um, how, how would you say that? Uh, the, the less, um, you know, uh, obvious choices and the less conservative choices are always the most risky, but also the most uh, appreciated. So in a way that that sort of uh, reflects um, what, what you were talking about regarding Locarno. Um, there is an invitation to Greg to talk about the retrospective we did for Locarno. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, so depending on um, who else wants to intervene in this uh, in this panel, or if Greg, you want to say something, you can um, request um, talking rights. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I don't know if anyone can hear me. 
Um, no, I don't want to take up too much time. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great panel. It's a great discussion. There's too many things I could say about Locarno, which is yeah one of the greatest audiences I've ever had the pleasure of, of showing things for. Um, but also the, the program, maybe it would take us a little bit off track in terms of what the topic is. But yeah, I just love the, I appreciate all of your, your sort of close attention to, to care and, and to ethics. These are really, really important keywords for me in terms of curation. And I tend to think of myself as an activist curator also. So maybe we can also talk about activism, sort of using curation as a tool in the struggle for liberation, uh, curating as sort of a polemical act. Those things are also important to me. But we, yeah, you've, you've covered a lot of great ground and I'm really just sort of sitting and, and listening and, and soaking it in. So yeah, I know time is short, but just deep appreciations for all of you for, for the work you're doing and for also sort of your self critique and, and sort of your focus on the lens um, as Maude mentioned in, in terms of sort of keeping that lens at, at heart in terms of what you're showing, what you're doing, who you're thinking with and, and who you're including. You know, that's how it starts. You know, change starts with you guys, right? All of us, me, you all, you guys are the professors in charge. You guys are the curators in charge. You guys are the Locarno Pro people in charge. So change is not abstract. It all starts with you. Um, so yeah, let the struggle continue. Well, also with you, Greg, you know, apart from, from programming also for Locarno and lots of other festivals, you're also the managing editor of a journal Nexus that I'm on the board of, and that's how Miriam and I know each other through Nex, and you're connected in that academic world. So don't be too humble, right? You, you're also <laughs> very much part of that. Thank you for saying so. Um, yeah, no, not trying to be too humble, just sort of trying to play my role however I can. And, you know, we're, we're all in this together, right? It's, it's sort of mutual work and, and mutual respect and yeah, it's, um, but yeah, thank you. Okay, I don't want to say anymore. I don't want to take up too much time. Appreciate the talk, listening quietly. Bye-bye. Well, thank you very much for this intervention. I think that was very, uh, very valuable as well and uh, very nice uh, concluding words as well. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists want to say uh, something else, but um, otherwise it's uh, midday or it's a bit past midday. So we'll uh, conclude um, this um, affirmative feminism seminar series with this brilliant panel. And I really want to thank you all for taking part and for really um, participating all wholeheartedly. Um, and I would like to thank the audience as well, uh, who has followed us. Um, so thank you very much.